Hi, mystery readers. I'm Alexandra Amore. This is It's a Mystery Podcast, and I'm here today with Paige Shelton. Hi, Paige. Hi, Alexandra. How are you? Very well. How are you? I'm doing great. Thanks so much for having me today. Oh, I'm so thrilled to have you here. So let me give a little introduction to our our listeners, I should say, and readers, I guess. Since the age of seven, when she penned a three-line poem about a wayward kite, Paige Shelton has wanted to be a writer. In 1997, she decided to take that dream seriously and was determined she would be published by Y2K. Fortunately, the world didn't end as the calendar turned because she wasn't even close to being published in 2000 or 2001 for that matter. It took 13 years of writing hundreds of thousands of words and many, and sorry, receiving many rejections, some cruel, some helpful, before she landed an agent and a contract for the first three books in her Farmer's Market Mystery Series, which we're going to talk about today. Farm Fresh Murder, published in 2010, hit the New York Times mass market bestseller list. Three more series and 15 books later, she's grateful to be living her dream. And I'm so thrilled that you're here today, Paige, to talk about all these different series. So maybe let's let's start with the Farmer's Market series. Um, so the main character is Becca Robbins. And I was reading a description today that said <laughs> that Becca makes jam and she goes from making jam to being in one which actually made me laugh out loud i was sitting here at my computer i thought that was hilarious so tell us a bit about becca and the farmer's market mysteries well the farmer's market mysteries were a product of a conversation i had with my agent i had landed my agent based upon another series that i was trying to sell it was a paranormal series it had ghosts and my agent really liked it and she signed me up but apparently nobody else did um Did we get locked up? No. Can you still see me? Okay. Oh, I can see you. The the picture isn't moving, but if you can hear me, that's great. So the Farmer's Market series, she couldn't, none of the publishers enjoyed the Paranormal series. So she she decided to have a conversation and we had a meeting on the phone about what other things I could write. And she listed off a few ideas and she said, Farmer's Market, and it pinged in my head. Becca became clear, the farmer's market became clear, and so I wrote three chapters of the farmer's market, the first book in the farmer's market, and she sold it quickly. Wow, oh, okay, that's, and then did you follow up with another one from that series right away? Um, yes, very quickly. The publisher at the time was buying three books at a time, so they bought the first three books of the series, so Fruit of All Evil came right after Farm Fresh Murder, and um, I, I had a chance to see Becca grow and expand right before my very eyes. It was a wonderful experience. Your first series, I, you know, I had no idea what that was going to be like, but it was a true joy to watch the characters grow and become who they became. Oh, nice. And um, I meant to ask you, so Becca is twice divorced, I noticed in one of the descriptions. So what's up with her? Is she sort of trying to get her life together? Why is she in this par- par- place in her life? Well, she basically she was a relationship disaster, and I thought, <laughs> yeah, I thought that would be a fun place to start, um, and to hopefully in the arc of the story make her not a relationship disaster, and hopefully that did get accomplished in the six books of the series. Um, but it was it was a fun challenge. I think every time I I come up or start with a new series. I try to think of the characters first and how I want them to change the most. And I think they all need to have some sort of issues, some sort of quirks. And that was the first thing that came to my mind. I'm not sure why, but that is the first thing that came. And I wanted to take her her personal story over the arc of the mysteries as well. Oh, very cool. I always love reading series that are like that, where the character is going through something and changes too. It, it, it again that was something when I was first starting I thought you know I want to be different I want to do something different and unique well come to find out that's something that's done a lot of, <laughs> a lot <laughs> changing the characters over time yes yeah exactly okay and then so then the second series is the country cooking school is that correct and that is. how did that come into being what prompted you to switch Well, I wanted two series. So again, I had a a phone meeting with my agent and um, we decided that a country cooking school would be would be appropriate for a cozy mystery series. So I sit down and I wrote the first three chapters of the country cooking school and she sold three books of that series as well. 
And then when I sat down to write for, um, If Fried Chicken Could Fly, finish it, because it was just three chapters, when I sat down to write that one, the ghost appeared. So that series was sold without a ghost. In fact, the ghost appeared in my office, but that might be another story for another time. <laughs> but, um, so I put the ghost onto the page, and then I wrote a letter to my editor and my agent, and I said, well, guess what? I've got a surprise. A ghost has shown up in these books. How do you feel about it? Fortunately, they were very open to it, and it turned into a paranormal series. Oh, fantastic. And so you must be drawn to paranormal series then because you had tried that initially. <clears throat> Excuse me. Well, you have, that's a great point. I didn't even realize I was drawn to paranormal, but I think I like a little bit of something otherworldly or something unexplainable in everything I write. I really enjoyed that. Mm. Yes. Okay. And so now I have to know, can you tell us the ghost story? Oh, I could. <laughs> it's that it, it, I was just writing and all of a sudden I felt like there was someone in my office behind me. Weird. I know. But I turned around and I looked and there was nobody there, but I turned back around to face the computer screen. And the next words I wrote were Jerome, the ghost had come to the town of Broken Rope, Missouri. And I thought, now, is that just all coincidental or was was I being visited by some sort of idea? And, you know, ghosts sometimes are manifestations of our imagination anyway. But, uh, but I think that the ghost came into the room and haunted me and insisted upon being part of the stories. Oh, that's fascinating. Wow, that's so great. Very it's cool. a little weird. It's a little <laughs> weird, but I'm okay with that. <laughs> oh, good, okay. Yeah, well, and the funny thing now is that I, my experience is that paranormal mysteries are very popular at this moment in time. Um, you know, when and then when I did write this series, my agent said, you know, there are going to be some people who just don't like paranormal. And I said, yeah, but there are some people that do. And I think that since that time, ooh, boy, I think that was 2012. I think since that time, paranormal series have actually found a larger audience. I yeah. do. I do too. Yeah. I see them more and more in the sort of in the tops of the lists and that kind of thing. Right. Right. Me too. Me yes. Too. Yeah, exactly. Okay. And then the third series, um, is that the Scottish bookshop or the, well, uh, the, they, they both, the Scottish bookshop and dangerous type kind of came together at the same time. Okay. Uh, it was an odd thing. Uh, probably more history than, than your listeners want, but, uh, um, the publisher, Berkeley Publishing combined with Penguin and their priorities kind of over time have changed and some of their cozy mystery series um, aren't, aren't being published any longer. Things are moving around within the publishing house. So I was frankly worried about where my career was going to go from there. So I thought, well, I need to put some stuff together and my agent and I again, um, uh, <laughs> where to go with things and what ideas we had and so I wrote the Scottish bookshop first I wrote that proposal first which again is a synopsis in three chapters and I wrote that first and at the time because of everything going on at Penguin and Berkeley they they said well we're not gonna we're gonna pass on that for now so my agent kind of put that into her files and then I started working on dangerous type and hopefully, to, you know, to interest Berkeley or Penguin because of, you know, their reprioritization of things. So I wrote that. And then so they liked that and they took that book. But at the same time, my agent had sent Scottish Bookshop to another publisher. So it was crazy. All at once, those two came together. Oh, I know. Yeah. <laughs> you must have had, I mean, you must have had some really tight deadlines then if you were kind of working on two series at the same time. The first year, they were very tight, very tight. Things have, you know, loosened up and we've managed to work things around better. But, at the first, yeah, the first year they were. But that's okay. I like working on two different series at the same time. It helps my creative well fill when I can step away from one and go to the other. So that was okay. Oh, that's good. Okay. And that, that was actually one of my questions was how, how you balance that. So we'll get to that in, in a few minutes. So then tell us a bit about the Scottish Bookshop. So they're set in Edinburgh. And there's a woman who's moved over there from Kansas. Is that right? It is. She's from uh, Kansas. Um, she actually had worked in a museum in Wichita, Kansas, 
which is one of the number of places that I lived as a kid. Um, and I don't remember much of Wichita, except we had a rock garden in our house. I remember that odd, odd <laughs> thing, but nevertheless. Um, uh, so she moved to Edinburgh, and I just chose one of the towns I used to live in, and Wichita happened to be the one. Um, I, I, I wrote the book, frankly, because I'm fascinated by Scotland, and I really wanted to go. I wanted to have <laughs> excuse a really good reason to go and I got lucky and was able to do that yeah oh, that's great and so did you go before writing the first book or while it was in progress while it wasn't while I was working on it once the proposal sold uh, oh in fact we're so you know I've been to Europe when I was younger but my family my husband and son and I had not gone to Europe at all I mean we'd been very uh, very locked in our lives in Salt Lake City raising our son and everything and so um, our son was in college in Missouri, and we got our passports, and we were we had our passports, and we were ready, and we were good to go, and everything like that. And we decided we were going to leave out of St. Louis because that's where my son was. We were going to go over spring break. So we get to the St. Louis airport. We're together. We're you know in line, and I'm first. Fine, Charlie's first, and our son Tyler gets up to the to the gate, and they look and they said his passport has expired. <gasps> I know. Can you oh. even imagine? I mean, we're so unsavvy. We felt so stupid. But anyway, so they said, no, he got it before he was, I guess, 16 or 18. And so therefore, it only lasted a, a short amount of time. Um, and so we were supposed to get it renewed before because he, uh, so anyway, we had to cancel our whole trip in St. Louis. We had to say, we can't go. Oh so we God. had to cancel it. Fortunately, the airlines worked with us. We got his passport. Everybody in Scotland who we had booked things with was so helpful and friendly. So we were able to reschedule everything. But can you imagine that feeling? It was, you I mean, your whole entire being just kind of falls apart. Yes. <laughs> so we went to a movie and drove back to Utah for spring break. Oh, my God. Oh, that's <laughs> terrible. Wow. It was terrible, but we ultimately ended up going, and then we went a few months later, and we had seven days, and I gave my husband and my son a four-page list of things we had to find and do, and it was nonstop for seven days, and had the greatest time. I mean, it was more than I ever imagined it could be beautiful, and the people were amazing, so it turned out okay, but yeah, that was our adventure. <laughs> oh, that's great. And was there anything that you discovered in Scotland that surprised you that you didn't expect? Um, well, we went up to Loch Ness, mm -hmm. and, and that was fun. And in my head, I had Loch Ness as, as a round, just a round lake that wasn't very big. Mm. Well, it's huge, and it's a long, wide lake. You know, it, it's it's enormous, and that was probably my biggest surprise. And so we didn't get to see Nessie, which was disappointing, yes. but maybe next time. <laughs> maybe next time, yes. Yeah, exactly. And there are fewer kilts than I expected. Oh. <laughs> I thought there would be a lot more men in kilts, and that was slightly disappointing, but I got over it. <laughs> yes, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, I was going to say, any sightings of Jamie from Outlander? No, no, but boy, wouldn't that be nice. Wouldn't that yeah. be nice, yeah. Particularly, yeah. <laughs> the one playing him on the TV series is awesome. He's great. Isn't so, he great? Yeah. Yeah, time. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I did go to um, Castle Dune. I, I'm afraid I'm mispronouncing it. I apologize, but I think it's Dune. And um, that is the castle that is in the second book of uh, of my Scottish series that just published. So it's of books and bagpipes. But in that castle is where they did a lot of filming of the Outlander series, and so that was fun. Oh, interesting, fascinating. So you you must you were there before the show came on, but you yes. must have been able. To, could you recognize a little bit of what you saw? Sorry, my no, that's out. okay, no problem. <laughs> uh, yes, I could. We could recognize, and so we put we play the show and we back up and we're like, remember, we were right there. <laughs> Right. Yeah. So typical. <laughs> yes. Yeah, exactly. Oh, lovely. Oh, that's great. Okay. So then Dangerous Type was, you were writing kind of at the same time and oh. it's set in Utah where you lived for ages at a, in a ski resort town. So tell us a little bit about that one as well. 
Well, when I lived in Utah, um, I lived in Salt Lake City, but Park City is only half an hour away, and Park City is a renowned ski resort, and it is a beautiful mountain city, and I loved visiting Park City. It is one of my favorite places to go. Pardon me. Oh, excuse me, I have allergies. Um, anyway, so we would frequently go to Park City, so I set uh, the Dangerous Type series in Star City, Utah. It's a okay. lot like Park City. Okay. And I made up the store, though. The, um, the Rescued Word is not a real store in Park City, although I think it should be. I think that would be very appropriate. <laughs> um, but I wanted to set something in a place where I would love to research and visit, and I wrote it before I knew we were moving to Arizona. Totally, completely before. Mm. So, but a good reason to go back to Utah and research if I need to. Yes, yeah. exactly. And the thing I thought that's really interesting about, about those books is that the store, um, they restore old typewriters and old books. Is that right? That's correct. And they sell stationery as well. Okay. They sell stationery from all over the world and pins and pencils, you know, I mean, number two pencils. Everybody's got to have some of those. So, <laughs> right. Yeah. yeah. And what a, I mean, that just seems, sounds like a dream come true for a writer to write about a store that does those sorts of things. Amazing. Absolutely a dream come true. It, it has been so much fun. I researched a lot of things for the first book, you know, printing presses, mm. presses in the book that um, the grandfather who originated, who started the store, uh, built a replica Gutenberg press, a mm. replica Gutenberg press. And so I got to research that you know, printing, book restoration, typewriter restoration. I mean, the, the the types and different amounts of typewriters that have been invented over time is astounding. I mean, I had no idea how many typewriters and, and, and things like typewriters there are in the world. So that was fun. And it has been a dream come true. It has been, it has been really fun to learn about typewriters and their inner workings, which for somebody who can barely figure out how to turn off a clock alarm, you know, that's, I'm surprised, but yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, it sounds amazing. And I, and as a writer, and we're both writers, thinking about writers in those days who would just have to bang away at those keys that were so stiff and, um, and then produce a page at a time with no ability to kind of edit as you go or any of that kind of stuff. It always makes me shake my head and just wonder how they did it. It makes me want to cry. Yeah. I just, it's just the thought of not being able to copy paste makes me want to, oh, I don't know how they did it. I have no idea. But they did. And some of them amazingly well. Yes. Yeah. Right. I know. Crazy. Yes, exactly. So we've covered the four series then. And, and my first question about all of them would be, so for example, I'm, I'm a big Lawrence Block fan. And he has several different mystery series. And some of them I read and some of them I don't. So do you find that readers pick and choose between the series or do they tend to like them all? No. Okay. <laughs> they don't like them all, <laughs> interestingly. Um, no, actually, I've, I've heard many comments, read a few things about, you know, this is just not the same as that other series or... I much prefer ghosts in my series, or can you believe there are ghosts in this series? I had to turn, I had to close the book when ghosts showed up because, no, I'm not going to read. You know, it is amazing the different tastes that readers have. So it is more about what you like to read than the author. At least that has been my experience completely. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, I can yeah. totally imagine that. Yeah, exactly. And so we've touched a little bit on the reasons that you've written several series and it's especially interesting that the Scottish bookshop one sold while the book the typewriter store one was also selling kind of at the same time is there something else within you that prompts you to to want to start a new series at all like do you feel like exploring a different part of the world or a different type of character or anything like that I think that it's that part of me that needs to always have two different things going at least two different things going mm -hmm. um, uh, we talked about Outlander a few minutes earlier, and I heard Diana Gabaldon, the writer, talk once about her creative well only feels, you know, she only has so much, then she has to step away and work on something else. And I think my creative well is about a quarter the size of hers, first of all. <laughs> yes. <laughs> There's no question. Um, but I think it's the same sort of thing. I, I, I only have so much, and then I have to put it away for a minute and let my subconscious work on it 
and and let things bubble to the surface a little bit. And so I think it's always a product of I don't want to just sit there and wait while that one's filling. I want to think of something else or work on something else. As you know, you know, writers write. It's yes. what it's it's what we do. And so um, so our our minds and our subconscious, everything has to find something to work on. Right. right. Exactly. Yes. And speaking of writers, right. Um, oh, the thought just flew out of my head. Jeez. Oh, okay. <laughs> oh well, I guess first, you know, do you have a bit of a writing routine? Do you do you have a regular writing practice? I wish. OK. Goodness. Every time I start a new project, I think, OK, this is the time I'm going to set a routine. I'm going to do it right. <laughs> and I'm going to make an outline that I'm going to stick to and I'm going to get up at a certain time and I'm going to get my exercise in before, you know, and it never fails that it never is the same. I wish I could. I think that would be wonderful to have a routine, but it just doesn't work out that way for me. The only thing I have really found is I think I really prefer writing at my computer at my desk. I don't like moving around very much. I try to work in coffee shops or, or restaurants or even on the couch or something like that. But I think the computer at my desk is my place. I think that's about the only routine I've established. Okay, right. And since you've wanted to write for so long, like from, from when you wrote that little three-line poem, yeah, um, is the writing life different than you thought it would be? Um, I think... The editing is harder than anybody could have ever prepared me for. <laughs> yeah. After the second draft about kills me every single solitary time. It is very, very, very hard for me. I don't think it is for everybody, but for me, it is particularly hard. I think it's because my first draft is so drafty. Mm. You know, there are things that need to be filled in and stuff. I think other there are other writers who can, who can punch out a first draft much better. But um, I think... Other than that, you know, I never expected glamour. There's no glamour. Um, I like the fact that I don't have to be dressed up and, you know, I can wear kind of what I want. I do enjoy that. So so in, in, in the ways that the lifestyle, I think it is what I expected. But as far as the, the editing, I'm surprised at how hard it really is for me. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, yeah exactly. Um, and do you have, since we've talked about how you, your brain likes to be entertained and kept busy, do you have another series in mind or are the two that you're working on now enough? Uh, I always have series in mind. Okay. I have, you know, I, you know, the whole file on my computer of, of first pages and first chapters and, and character ideas and things I saw somewhere that I like to put into a book somewhere, you know, so uh, constantly constantly but nothing that my agent is working on selling right okay. now oh, okay right and so are you, i should clarify maybe are you working on all four that are, are are all four series active now the only two i'm working on right now are the scottish and the dangerous type okay. um a farm for or farmer's market and cooking school uh, Berkeley did not renew along with many of the other series, you know, the cozy series, they are, you know, turning kind of a different direction. So they did not renew those. However, I keep promising the, the cooking school, um, readers that I have one more book I'm working on to finish things up. And I thought I would just self publish it. Um, when I got it done, it's not done yet. And I need to work on it. I need to get it done, but I have the whole finish of the story in my head. So that's oh, Okay. Okay. So they can look forward to one, at least one more. At least one more at some point, hopefully this year, hopefully. Yeah, okay. Yeah, you, but you're not making any promises, I can tell. No promises, no promises. <laughs> right, okay. Um, well, I think that's all the questions that I had for you today. Did, was there anything else you wanted to tell us about your books or your um, any of your series? Well, just thank you to everybody who reads and gives them a try and, and looks at them. I really do appreciate it quite a bit. Um, uh, I, I'm I'm just on Facebook if anybody wants to talk to me about it. But thanks to all my readers and thanks to you. I really appreciate this. This has been very fun. Oh, you're so welcome. It's my pleasure. And we can mention that your website is pageshelton.com. That is, yep. Just www.pageshelton.com right there. And page is with an I, obviously. <laughs> yeah. Yes. And as you mentioned, you're on Facebook as well. So people can find you there too. And your books are available on all the online retailers. Yep, everywhere. Okay. Yeah, everywhere that, that you can get that. Yeah. Very cool. All right. Well, thanks again so much, Paige. It's been great chatting well, with you. 
Thank you very much, Alexandra. You're welcome. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.